Hello everybody and welcome to Nutrition 101. Today we are going to be discussing the micronutrients, um, also known as vitamins and minerals. And this will culminate in a brief overview of a number of different vitamins and a discussion of the role of minerals and vitamins in a number of body processes as well as the food sources that you can obtain them from. And then the next lecture is going to be digging into a little bit more things like the cardiovascular system, bone health, and the uh, antioxidant activity of a number of different nutrients many of which include the minerals, which at that point we'll go into significantly more detail about them. Uh, and as well as discussing the role of the vitamins in those various processes. And after that will be the midterm. And after the midterm, we'll begin to discuss things like maintaining a healthy weight, uh, nutrition, as it relates to physical activity, and we'll go through the life cycles of uh, humans and discuss the various needs that the human body has during childhood and during pregnancy and as well as adulthood and aging. That will bring us around near the end of the semester, at which point hopefully all of you will be working diligently on your final projects, which will have been assigned as the midterm comes to a close. And then that will be the end of the semester and there will be a final exam that is cumulative of all the material that we've talked about. And hopefully you will have pertained a large portion of this information and can carry it on into your lives and help it benefit you. So Micronutrients. So, as you may have guessed, uh, micronutrients contrast with macronutrients in that we don't need very much of them. However, they are highly essential for our survival. Vitamins min and minerals are typically needed in milligram or microgram quantities, whereas all of the macronutrients are needed in number large numbers of grams. Vitamins and minerals assist our body functions, especially energy metabolism, but also in formation and maintenance of healthy cells and tissues. And in general, the recommended daily allowances that are given in any of these uh, slides are generally the minimum amount that you need to not suffer a deficiency, and you should in general get more than that to be healthy. And another rule of thumb when, it deal, coming, when dealing with micronutrients is that the wider the variety of colors of foods that you consume, uh, the, in general, greater diversity of micronutrients that you are obtaining. This has to do with the fact that many micronutrients are brightly colored and have a very rich um, collection of uh, molecules that all have specific energy levels that give them bright colors and therefore foods that contain those tend to absorb a lot of light in the visible spectrum. So the first thing I'm going to mention and we're going to expand upon minerals a lot more in the next lecture, uh, these are naturally occurring inorganic elements. Uh, these come from the periodic table. The ones that contain carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are the subject of the, are generally the macronutrients, and so we don't talk about them as minerals. Um, minerals exist in the simplest possible chemical form, and therefore they don't get digested or broken down. But prior to absorption, they just go into the body as they are. And we characterize minerals as either major minerals, trace minerals, or ultra trace minerals. Now, the 
major minerals are ones that we require at least 100 milligrams a day or more. And these are things that you may have heard of before, like sodium and potassium, but also things like phosphorus and chloride, and then calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Trace minerals that are necessary for our proper functioning are things like fluoride, iron, manganese, and zinc. Those all have very specific functions in our body. And then more recently discovered ultra-trace minerals, um, and by re more, more recently discovered, I mean their function in the body is more recently discovered because many of these have been known for a long time. These are things you require less than one milligram a day, and things like chromium, or copper, or iodine, or molybdenum, or selenium. Uh, you, some of the, you've probably heard of copper and iodine because especially if you have a thyroid condition, iodine becomes very important. But these other ones are sort of uh, more obscure. So the main function of minerals in the body is as electrolyte nutrients, and we'll talk about this a lot. Uh, salts, um, which dissolve in water, produce ions, and these help translate electrical impulses throughout your body and function in signaling processes. So potassium is inside of your cells. Uh, in general, a, higher, a diet higher in potassium causes your less fluid retention in your extracellular matrix, which leads to a lower blood pressure. Uh, you need about two times more of it than you do sodium. And often kidney disease causes potassium imbalance as well as diabetes. Vitamin D generally boosts absorption of potassium and calcium carbonate, which is a common antacid, decreases absorption. Sodium, on the other hand, is the, the mineral that's found outside your cells. Uh, sodium sucks water out of your cells and makes your blood volume increase. In general, if you have high blood pressure, they'll put you on something called the DASH diet, which lowers your sodium intake and increases your potassium intake. Uh, and if you have kidney disease, you will in general retain sodium, which uh, could exacerbate things like congestive heart disease. Salt is often very high, or sodium is often very high in processed foods, which is why eating whole foods is often on the list of things to do to lower your sodium intake. Uh, phosphorus is a co-anion for potassium. It exists inside of your cells. And as we talked about, it's a component of phosphate, which is a major energy storage and um, work doing molecule in, in cellular respiration. Phosphorus absorption is boosted by vitamin D. Again, calcium carbonate decreases absorption. Phosphorus, in addition to being involved in cellular respiration, is also a bone mineral. And um, in addition to being a component of ATP and a bunch of other enzymes and molecules, it is a component of phospholipids, which means that it's a component of cell membranes. It's a component of lipoproteins, which are the transport proteins for fat in your blood. And then it's also a component of DNA and RNA. So phosphorus is basically in every part of your body. And then chloride is generally found alongside sodium. It is a negative ion. And in general, we get it a lot more from processed foods than not processed foods. Chloride is mostly essential for the production of hydrochloric acid in your stomach. Uh, chloride is also, uh, can be converted into uh, hypochlorate, which is chloride bonded to an oxygen. Uh, the only reason I mention this is that it's one of your immune system's primary defenses against intruders. Hypochlorous acid will kill bacteria and viruses and other antigens. Calcium and magnesium are both very large components of your skeletal system and are both also involved in muscle contraction. And this is a table which you can uh, reference for any kind of numbers that you might need. Uh, for instance, when trying to determine how much of these um, minerals that you need in a day. 
this also tells you the things that they do in your body. So sodium is functions in fluid balance, acid base balance, transmission of nerves and impulses and muscle contraction. Um, I'm not going to read the whole table to you because uh, you can look at it at your own leisure and we'll talk about all of these things individually. Uh, the, another important thing is the amount of these things that you should take in. It's a fairly detailed list and it also tells you a bunch of different food sources for these one that's on this list that i didn't mention before is sulfur uh, the reason it's not always talked about in the minerals is because it's found in b vitamins and amino acids so in general that's where you get it and so you don't have to actively supplement sulfur in your diet this there are some also trace and ultra trace minerals that are on this list so fluoride iron manganese and zinc which i mentioned this is all uh tells you their specific functions so fluoride is very important in uh, tooth and bone structure iron is part of your red blood cells in the form of hemoglobin and myoglobin in your muscles and also is involved in enzyme systems manganese is part of a lot of different proteins especially ones in the bones and then zinc is also part of in enzymes and is important in immune function, things like sexual maturation and gene regulation. And then ultra trace minerals like chromium is important in glucose transport. Uh, copper is important in iron transport as well as various enzyme systems. Iodine is important for thyroid hormones and temperature regulation. Molybdenum is a component of some enzyme proteins and selenium. In, in, is very interesting because in addition to being required for carbohydrate and fat metabolism, it's also an antioxidant. And uh, just uh, for anybody, uh, in this symbol here, uh, it says 35 with a little Greek letter mu. That means micrograms per day. Uh, that, I'm not sure if that's a symbol that everybody's encountered, but there you go. That's what that means. So, the first thing we're going to really talk about uh, is vitamins, because vitamins are fairly complex molecules, and there are a number of different families of vitamins that are all sort of grouped together, and so they warrant their own detailed discussion. So, in general, vitamins regulates, regulate our body functions. So minerals are generally part of things like proteins or they exist in the, the cytoplasm or the, the, the plasma in your blood or the water, various places, and act to provide or, uh, or attract electric charge. Um, vitamins, on the other hand, tend to be added to proteins uh, or act as coenzymes that participate directly in the reactions and are not. Um, used up in the process and in general different forms of vitamins are have a higher or lower bioavailability which refers to how easily the vitamin is taken up from the foods and this is especially important when dealing with supplements so supplemental forms of vitamins tend to be easier to synthesize but are not as readily available to your body as the vitamins as the vitamins that are found in food. Another thing that has been a feature of the 20th century is that in the uh, early, like during the Great Depression, there were a lot of issues with malnutrition due to uh, the reliance on uh, corn and the bleaching of wheat. So when you bleach wheat, you remove many B vitamins from it as well as a lot of minerals and so if you don't want to suffer from malnutrition when eating those foods you have to supplement them you have to enrich those flowers with vitamins again um, now this might seem counterintuitive but the bleaching process was introduced mostly as a anti-spoilage uh, act action so you bleach the grain so that the fungus doesn't grow but in the process you take away some of the nutritive quality. This is an argument, I would say, for uh, small-scale farming, because in general, if you have a giant, 
field of wheat and you get some that has fungus on it in the batch and then it poisons the whole batch, then you may have distributed that before anybody realizes it and then you have uh, a whole, totally ruined batch of grain. So then you have to bleach it in order to prevent that from happening. Uh, on the other hand, when small batches, you don't have to. You can just hand select the good wheat from the bad, and then it's you don't have to worry about that spoilage vector. Vitamins are, in general, carbon-containing compounds, and they come in two varieties. The first variety is are what are called fat-soluble vitamins, and these are vitamins A, D, E, and K, which are readily stored in body fat. And these, because they st are stored in body fat and you have basically unlimited amounts of body fat available, they can become toxic if they are taken in excess. Uh, this is in general uh, caused by something called megadosing, where you take greater than 10 times the recommended daily intake. Otherwise, if you take less than that, you generally use up those vitamins at a rate that is uh, fast enough to present to prevent toxicity. Now, water-soluble vitamins, on the other hand, are found in the, um, the, the plasma of your body, the water-soluble components. Things like vitamin C, also known as ascorbic acid, and B vitamins are water-soluble. B vitamins include thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, folate, pantothenic acid, and biotin. These are in general not stored in large amounts, except for vitamin B12, which is has a whole recycling process, and these must therefore be consumed on a daily or weekly basis. Uh, toxicity of these is rare, but can occur if you are supplementing. And oftentimes, deficiencies of these vitamins can cause serious diseases or syndromes which arise fairly quickly so if you go without b vitamins for two weeks even you might start to lose your hair for instance and in general vitamin mineral absorption is dependent on the chemical form so even things like iron so dietary iron uh, comes in two forms heme iron which is generally only found in meats fish and poultry and non-heme iron which is found in all in plant and also in animal foods as well as iron fortified foods and supplements now the difference is that they have two different uh, ionic charges which is not something that you need to know about but uh, you can convert non-heme iron to heme in the body it just takes energy and is takes also takes longer and is less efficient so you have to consume significantly more than you would if you consumed it from meat other things that affect absorption are binding factors so some vitamins and minerals bind to other things in food like mineral iron and zinc and calcium bind to fiber and in high fiber foods and that hinders their absorption another thing that can stop things from being absorbed are oxalic acid which is found in a lot of green vegetables uh, and tea and many vitamins are modified via chemical transformation after they're eaten and turned into a number of other useful molecules this is especially true of the b vitamins which generally combine with other substances to form metabolic molecules and products. Uh, oftentimes, these, this is what activates the vitamin, uh, but the vitamins are stored in their vitamin form because it's, they have multiple uses and they oftentimes uh, can be recycled. In general, the minerals do not undergo chemical transformations because they are... Um, elements, so those the only way to break down an element is by it be a, a nuclear reaction. However, I, things like iron, for instance, can adjust its atomic structure because it can go from one charge state to another charge state. And this is a graphic showing the process by which an enzyme can be activated by a vitamin and a coenzyme. So 
See here, the enzyme exists, and the compounds that are related to the enzymes are free to fly about when they don't react because the enzymes are not activated. Um, if you get your coenzymes and your vitamins in place, such as in coenzyme A, for instance, then it suddenly makes the enzyme the right shape to accept the molecules that it's designed for. And then those reactions can are free to proceed at uh, their leisure, and when the new products are released, the activated enzyme complex remains intact. Now, if it turned out that the body needed a different set of enzymes, but that all interacted with the same vitamins and the coat factors, then the body might digest the enzyme, leaving behind the vitamin and the vitamin could go on to bond to another enzyme. So, I mentioned that you can sometimes overdose on vitamins by taking too many, and this is in general happens when you take supplements, especially supplements that have enormous amounts of various things. I have seen B vitamin supplements, supplements that have 500 to 1,500 percent of your daily value for B vitamins, for instance. There's really no reason to consume that much. It, you're either going to urinate it out or it's going to damage your liver and then you're going to urinate it out. In addition, some supplements can contain things that people are allergic to uh, or that are certain demographics have chronic sensitivities to, and in general, most minerals are better absorbed from animal sources than from supplements. So if you, even if, if you're a vegetarian, for instance, and you eat an egg, you're going to get significantly more B vitamins and vitamin A and vitamin D than you would if you took a supplement. By the same token... Enriching a low-nutrient food with vitamins and minerals doesn't automatically make that a healthy food. So, you can have a little Debbie snack that has enriched flour in it and an iron supplement. It doesn't make that little Debbie snack good for you. It just means that you won't starve to death eating it. The best way to get a wide variety of the correct amounts of micronutrients is to eat a variety of healthful foods, which provides in general, more nutrients, as well as things like phytochemicals and also other dietary benefits than supplements. So things like soluble and insoluble fiber, and especially soluble and insoluble fiber of a chemical form that your body recognizes, because there are plenty of fiber supplements out there that just are some random fiber molecule that isn't necessarily something that is found in nature. So it just causes diarrhea, basically. Foods in general, if you consume whole foods or even semi-processed foods, they provide a balance of micronutrients that enter your system in a regulated fashion, um, which is more in line with how your body absorbs and consumes them. The other benefit of eating food instead of taking supplements is it offers social, emotional, and uh, other benefits that are absent from supplements. Uh, it might seem silly, but just the act of consuming food can have s significant uh, mental health implications. Now that said, in certain populations, preg uh, or demographics, such as the demographic of pregnant women, micronutrient supplements are actually very important and are one of the reasons that infant mortality rates have gone down. Um, so, obviously, everything in moderation is probably the best way to put it. Now, the other thing that micronutrients tend to do is help our bodies prevent or treat disease. So, Adequate intake of the following nutrients, the ones listed here, has been associated with lower risk for certain diseases like vitamin D, reducing your risk of colon cancer. 
or vitamin E and diabetes complications, vitamin K and osteoporosis. This is because vitamin K is actually turns out to be involved in calcium metabolism. Um, calcium in pregnancy, you can uh, avoid something called induced hypertension, where having a baby puts a load on your cardiovascular system. Uh, chromium is an interesting one because there's a chromium mo molecule that's involved in glucose or in uh, insulin regulation of glucose, so it's helpful for people with diabetes. Uh, magnesium is involved in muscle contraction and so can help mitigate the effects of muscle wasting in older adults. And then potassium I mentioned earlier for high blood pressure. There are also other essential micronutrients. So there's a bunch of research that is concerns emergent micronutrients, things like other elements or vitamin-like molecules that could possibly have beneficial, beneficial health effects. Uh, one of them is carnitine, which your body actually makes and it's involved in, as I mentioned in the metabolism lecture, it's involved in transporting uh, molecules into the mitochondria for use in the electron transport chain and the Krebs cycle. Also, boron is an element that's near carbon and nitrogen and is possible beneficial uh, activities in the body. Nickel is a metal that has uh, possible use as a component of proteins. And then silicon is similar, chemically similar to carbon, and um, silicate molecules are very important in mineralogy, and there's also a uh, always a certain amount of it present in the body. These are obviously not yet classified because status, more study is needed. But uh, the ultimate goal is for, to be able to use uh, micronutrient profiles that can could be specific to an individual. Another class of molecules that aren't vitamins but are equally, or not equally, but very important, are phytochemicals. And these are generally naturally occurring plant chemicals that are also brightly colored and are byproducts often of the synthesis of vitamins. These generally have health-promoting properties and work in synergy with other plant compounds to do things like reduce inflammation, impede cancer growth, enhance immune function, protect against cardiovascular disease, and inhibit lipid synthesis, which can help be um, an anti-obesity agent. That's an interesting one. In general, the research has focused on the beneficial role of phytochemicals in increasing the effectiveness of medication uh, used to treat disease. Uh, this is also still in clinical trials, but there has been a synergistic effect shown in a treatment of bacterial infections that have developed a resistance to antibiotics and also in chemotherapy drugs in the really treatment of cancer. Phytochemicals don't generally have a recommended daily allowance or an upper limit, but instead they protect our cells. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, they protect our cells not by actually protecting them, but by stressing them in a very uh, controlled and specific way which triggers our internal defense mechanisms. Uh, for this reason, experts generally recommend against phytochemical supplementation because if you are trying to just grease the wheels in your body enough to uh, get things moving, then if you dump a bunch of things that might be toxic in large amounts into your body, it's going to have negative consequences. And the way, so therefore, if you're not going to supplement, you should instead just consume a plant-based diet consisting of as many whole foods as possible. Because things like green leafy vegetables will have these naturally. So, now we're going to launch into a more detailed discussion of vitamins. So we'll start with the water-soluble vitamins, which include all of the B vitamins and vitamin C. And then we'll move on to discuss the fat-soluble vitamins, which are stored in the fatty tissues and liver. And uh, we'll also talk about a number of different phytochemicals and wrap our 
discussion up with a number of um, real world health tips for getting foods that are loaded with vitamins. So before I move on, there are a number of previously named vitamins that we don't really talk about anymore because they've been renamed or it's been discovered that we don't actually need them after all. Uh, a number of the first two vitamins B4 and B8 uh, are actually part of our DNA and therefore we don't need to consume them in our food. Those are adenine and adenylic acid. So they are no longer classified as B vitamins. Um, vitamin F, it turned out, was actually just essential fatty acids, which we, which we get in our fat consumption, and because it's a macronutrient, we it doesn't qualify for being a micronutrient. Vitamins G and H got reclassified as B vitamins. Uh, vitamin D. J as well got reclassified as B2. Vitamin L was determined to not be essential. Uh, vitamin L2, it turns out to be an RNA metabolite, which is made by your body. Vitamin M is a B vitamin. Vitamin O is carnitine, which is made in the body. Vitamin P is now the flavonoids, which are not a vitamin, but rather a phytochemical. Uh, vitamin PP is niacin, which is a B vitamin. Vitamin S is salicylic acid, which is aspirin. It is not an essential micronutrient. And then vitamin U is uh, a form of methionine, which is an amino acid, which comes from protein and therefore is not a vitamin. And there are a number of well-known deficiency diseases of the water-soluble vitamins. So B, vitamin B1 or thiamine, the deficiency is called beriberi. The deficiency of riboflavin causes uh, uh, weakness in the skin, eyes, and nails, uh, and brittleness. Niacin or B3 deficiency is called pellagra, which in general in the United States came from a fully corn-based diet during the Great Depression. Another thing about niacin is they use megadoses of it to try to increase your HDL cholesterol and decrease your LDL cholesterol. There is uh, panathenic acid or vitamin B5, the deficiency of which is called alopecia. And there's uh, B6 deficiency, which is, leads to rough corners of the mouth, and it uh, can exacerbate carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, biotin, or B7 uh, deficiency, can cause dermatitis. Uh, raw eggs have a protein in them that interferes with absorption of biotin, as well as sulfa drugs, which are a compound, a type of antibiotic. Folic acid or B9 deficiency can lead to neural tube def defects in pregnancy uh, or macrocytic anemia in adults. And then vitamin B12 deficiency leads to pernicious anemia and vitamin C deficiency leads to scurvy. And this is a large table showing the water-soluble vitamins. Uh, this is a lot of information to look at on a screen. However, hopefully you're downloading the lecture notes from the Blackboard or Google Classroom pages. And you can sit and peruse this at your leisure. Um, we we're going we're to talk about all these different functions and data, but this is a nice collection of everything in one place. So you may have heard of the B vitamin complex being referred to in uh, health articles or on uh, packaging for supplements. The B vitamin complex is so named because they're often found together in foods and they often work together in your body for metabolic processes. Um, these are also all water soluble, so they need it every day and we don't store them, so we lose the extra ones and the extra vitamins in our urine. And they're generally found in whole grains, veggies, beans, or they're returned with enrichment 
to flowers. Uh, we only enrich thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, and folate. Uh, therefore, we tend to lose B6, B12, and B9. Now, here's a table. It's kind of an interesting table. It gives you a number of common foods that contain at least 50% of your daily recommended intake for the selected B complex vitamins. In general, B vitamins are found in meat in great abundance. They're also found in a number of animal products that are not meat, which is handy if you are a vegetarian. It's also found in a number of legumes, although not all of the B vitamins are found in legumes. So you see here, the legumes don't have thiamine, they don't have riboflavin, they don't have niacin, but they do have B6, B9, uh, and they don't have B12 or B5. Now, dairy also doesn't have thiamine, but generally has riboflavin, um, and sometimes yogurt has pantothenic acid. Grains also have thiamine, but you can't get riboflavin or niacin. You can get B6 from, from rice, you can get folate from rice, you can't get B12. You also get pantothenic acid from sunflower seeds. And then vegetables don't generally have a lot of B vitamins other than thiamine, uh, niacin, B6. And mushrooms sometimes have pantothenic acid. Interesting thing about B12 that I mentioned in the vegetarian section of the protein lecture is that you can get vitamin B12 from yeast. So vitamin B1, we're going to start at the beginning here. Uh, another name for B1 is thiamine or TPP, which is a coenzyme. This is the coenzyme form. It was first identified in 1937 and its functions were identified around the 50s or 60s. It generally participates in over 20 enzyme reactions, and it's required for the metabolism of protein, carbohydrates, and fats. And the DRI for adult females is uh, 1.1 milligrams, and for adult males is 1.2 milligrams. This is the thiamine molecule. You don't have to know the chemistry of it, but it's um, sometimes helpful to look at. It contains a highly active nitrogen center, which affects this nitrogen center. Thiamine is also essential for the production of ATP from glucose, um, which is involved in energy metabolism. It's uh, essential for the production of ribose from ribose nucleic acids, and also acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. We may mention the deficiency disease is beriberi, and it is widely distributed in foods, especially in rich grains and flour, pork, lentils, and nuts. However, it is destroyed during cooking, and um, therefore uh, you can get a lot of it from things like uh, salads. Um, so thiamine is essential for the production of ATP from glucose. It's essential for energy metabolism. It's essentially for the production of ribose in RNA and for the synthesis of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. <clears throat> Deficiency disease is beriberi, and it's widely distributed in foods like enriched grains and flour, pork, lentils, and nuts. However, it's destroyed during cooking and destroyed during storage and can also be destroyed by the enzymes in raw fish. So it's important to get it from a fresh source. It was also the first vitamin discovered because white rice intake in Asia caused beriberi in the 1800s, which is eliminated by cooking brown rice instead of white rice. And here's a picture of some foods that contain thiamine. The next one, vitamin B2, is called also known as riboflavin. And it also has names uh, 
it's a component of the molecules FMN, which is flavin mononucleotide, and FAD, flavin adenine dinucleotide, which are both molecules that are involved in cellular respiration. It was also identified in the late 30s, and it's important in energy metabolism. It also supports normal vision and skin health, and the DRI is between 1.1 and 1.3 milligrams for adults. And this is the molecule. It has this big ring structure on it that has a lot of energy in it. This is a picture here of cracked lips that are caused by a deficiency. This is caused, it causes slow healing of injuries. Um, flavin comes from the word Latin for yellow. Uh, and riboflavin is in involved in the formation of coenzymes for the breakdown of fatty acids and ener for energy from carbohydrates and uh, fat and protein. It's generally abundant in dairy and pork, as well as in rich grains and green leafy vegetables, and it's also needed to convert other vitamins into their active form. Uh, this is a bunch, These are a bunch of foods that have riboflavin in them. So you notice the green vegetables like asparagus and broccoli, you got eggs, you got cheeses and yogurts, you got shellfish and mushrooms as well as beef and pork. Then there's niacin, which is vitamin B3, also known as nicotinic acid, nicotinamide, and niacinamide. Uh, this is a major component of the molecule NAD, or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or its phosphate form NADP. And these are also very important in cellular respiration and was identified in the 30s. We also have learned that we can synthesize niacin from tryptophan, and that was discovered in 1946. And it's important in energy metabolism, as well as supporting skin health, the nervous system health, and the digestive system. If you have a deficiency of it, you will have diarrhea, abdominal pain, vomiting, inflamed, swollen, bright red tongue, depression, apathy, fatigue, loss of memory, and dermatitis. And if you overdose in it and become toxic, you will also have diarrhea, but then you'll have heartburn and nausea, as well as ulcers, irritation, vomiting, and then fainting, dizziness, fatigue, headache, painful flush, hives, excessive sweating, liver damage, and low blood pressure. You need about between 14 and 16 milligrams in a day, uh, but no more than 35 milligrams. If you get 60 milligrams of the amino acid tryptophan, which is in about a 1 to 60 ratio in protein that you don't use to fix your body, um, you can synthesize niacin from that excess protein. And um, the deficiency of this is called pellagra which is Italian for rough skin, and you can see over here, this man has the signs of niacin deficiency around his neck and face. This condition was endemic in the southeast U.S. in the early 20th century because of a corn-based diet, and uh, the general, there's something called the three Ds, dermatitis, diarrhea, and dementia, which result from deficiency, and there's also a fourth D, which is death, which is for all of them. If you don't get enough, that's what happens. You get niacin from meat, fish, mushrooms, beans, peanuts, and enriched flours, and it can also be synthesized from extra amino acids. You can take a high dose of niacin to treat high density, like to increase your HDL and lower your LDL cholesterol, uh, but this, if you take the supplemental form for this high dose, it may cause flushing, which can cause problems. Now I mentioned before B4 isn't considered an essential vitamin anymore, so we move on to B5, which is panophenic acid. Pano meaning everywhere. This means that it's abundant in our diets which and deficiency is rare. However, it can be found with alcoholism and malnutrition. It is part of coenzyme A, which I've mentioned in relation to the breakdown of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. 
It's also important in the synthesis of neurotransmitters, steroid hormones, hemoglobin, and cholesterol and fatty acids for the repair of tissues. This is a picture of panthenic acid as it occurs in coenzyme A. So there's the acid right there, and then this is the whole molecule. This was identified in 1953, and you need to get 5 milligrams in a day to be healthy. If you are deficient in it, it can cause vomiting, nausea, stomach cramps, insomnia, fatigue, depression, irritability, and restlessness. And it is widespread in foods, especially organ meats, avocados, broccoli, and grains. And this is another picture. Um, it's a bit blurry, but we mentioned uh, acetyl coenzyme A in our discussion of the Krebs cycle. This shows where panathenic acid falls in that molecule and then other parts that are relevant for organic chemistry. Vitamin B6 is called pyridoxine or pyridoxol or pyridoxamine or PLP. The, this was also identified in the late 30s and it's important for amino acid and fatty acid metabolism. It's one of the things that helps convert tryptophan to niacin, but also to serotonin, and it helps make red blood cells. You need to get at least 1.3 milligrams, but no more than 100 milligrams of pyridoxine. And here are the three, four different molecules. They're essentially the same as one another with just a slight variation in this group that occurs up here, and then the phosphate form, which is used in energy metabolism, has a phosphate group on it, just like many things in energy metabolism. B6 is a component of over 100 enzymes, and it's needed for a number of transamination reactions, which convert amino acids into other amino acids. It also helps form white blood cells, I mentioned that it synthesized neurotransmitters and converts tryptophan into niacin. Uh, deficiency was discovered in 1954 with infant formula, where it, the deficiency caused anemia, poor growth, headaches, tingling, and depression. There's another function of B6, which is that it is hypothesized to break down homocysteine, and um, this causes women with higher B6 levels to have a lower risk of cardiovascular disease. It also has roles in car carpal tunnel sy syndrome, PMS, and uh, immunity in elderly people. Deficiency of B6 uh, causes anemia, smooth tongue, cracked corners of the mouth, abnormal brain wave patterns, irritability, insomnia, muscle twitching, convulsions, irritation of sweat glands, scaly dermatitis, and kidney stones. Whereas toxicity caused bloating, depression, fatigue, irritability, there's both of them, headache, nerve damage causing numbness and muscle weakness leading to an inability to walk and bone pain. So some of these are very important to not overdose on. And in general, you get B6 from green and leafy vegetables, meats, fish, poultry, shellfish, legumes, fruits, and grains, but this is lost in processing and is not enriched back in. So it's really important to get this one from fresh foods. Like these. B, vitamin B7 is known as biotin. Uh, biotin was discovered when rats fed a raw egg whites only, developed hair loss, dermatitis, and neuromuscular dysfunction. It's sad that we had to abuse animals in order to discover this, but there it is. Um, so biotin is in egg yolks, specifically as well as in liver, nuts and yogurt, and cooked egg whites. Uh, it's also produced by beneficial flora and is decreased with uh, certain, um, with a malabsorptive state like the drinking of alcohol, as well as taking anticonvulsive drugs or consuming raw egg whites. So don't do that. This is the molecule. Um, it's important for energy metabolism as well as fat synthesis, which is important for tissue repair. It's also important for amino acid metabolism, which is important in both tissue repair and body function maintenance. 
and glycogen synthesis, so it helps with storage. You need 30 micrograms a day, and if you, in the rare case that you become deficient in it from binge eating egg whites, uh, you could experience loss of appetite, nausea, depression, lethargy, hallucinations, muscle pain, weakness, fatigue, seizures, drying, scaly dermatitis, hair loss. Uh, if you are, uh, if you are looking to get it in your food, or you think you might be deficient, you can get it from organ meats or egg yolks. It's also found in soybeans, fish, and whole grains. And at this point in our discussion of B vitamins, I feel that it is nice to take a look at a really complicated graphic. Uh, this just shows the Krebs cycle. Uh, our old nemesis, and listed on it are all of the vitamin derivatives that find their way into this cycle. So THF is a type of uh, folic acid, which we haven't discussed yet, but PLP was one of the forms of um, panathenic acid. Uh, there's B12, there's NAD, which was from uh, B3, uh, that's coenzyme A, FAD, which we, which was from P2. There's uh, biotin right there, and then um, FMN, which is uh, one of the mononucleotides of flavin. And uh, this is just a. Um, this is here to show you. Uh, there's another molecule called choline, which is not listed among the B vitamins, but is water-soluble and is also important in, in the same systems that B vitamins are involved in, uh, specifically homocysteine metabolism, as well as neurotransmitter synthesis, phospholipid synthesis, and transport of fats via cholesterol. Uh, choline is what we call a vitamin-like essential nutrient, and um, we generally need between uh, 425 and 550 milligrams. If you get too much of it, you can experience excessive body odor or sweating, salivation, reduced growth rate, low blood pressure, or liver damage. Um, and choline is only conditionally essential. Uh, it is, can technically be made in the body from methionine, which is an essential amino acid, but methionine is not always abundant in all diets, uh, making deficiency fairly uh, rare except in situations where there's a methionine deficiency or in women who are postmenopausal because choline is related to estrogen. And women who are postmenopausal typically experience estrogen dips. Uh, choline can be found in milk, liver, eggs, and peanuts. Uh, so if you're a vegan, hopefully you don't have a peanut allergy. Choline is involved in proper liver function as well as healthy brain development and cell wall integrity as muscle movement and nervous system function via acetylcholine as well as metabolism. It's especially important during pregnancy because if you have a low intake, it can risk raise the risk of neural tube defects in unborn babies as well as preeclampsia, premature birth, or low birth weight. And it is essential for the making a substance that's required for removing cholesterol from your liver. Therefore, inadequate choline can result in fat and cholesterol buildup in your liver. And... As a constituent of lecithin, which is a phospholipid, it's present in eggs and in many plants and animal organs. Uh, your body does make it, but you need to get it in your diet to avoid a deficiency. However, a single egg gives you between 20 and 25% of your daily requirement, so an omelet in the morning it pretty much gets you there. And if you really want to make your omelet... Uh, a choline factory, you can make yourself a salmon, broccoli, and cauliflower omelet. Now, the last two B vitamins that we're going to talk about are folate and vitamin B12. Folate is 
involved in energy metabolism, but it's also involved in DNA synthesis, which is arguably much more important, especially for developing infants. Vitamin B12 is all is in addition to being, um, it's involved in the metabolism of homocysteine is involved in blood formation and nervous system function. So probably the two most important functions in your body. Folate or vitamin B9 is so named because it comes from foliage like spinach. The deficiency of folate causes something called macrocytic anemia. Uh, because it's involved in um, cell division and DNA metabolism, if you can't divide your cells, your cells just grow larger and larger, hence the name macrocytic. Um, this is specifically your red blood cells, uh, meaning that you have less red blood cells, but they're larger, which generally decreases your oxygen transport. Uh, because it's involved in cell cell differentiation, it's also responsible for neural, neural tube defects in uh, pregnancy. If you don't get enough vitamin B9, your child's spinal cord will, or spinal column won't develop, and the spinal cord will pop out the back and bubble, and it's really gross and life-ruining. Uh, you get folate from lentils as well as rich grains, asparagus, legumes, oranges, and yeast. And supplementation uh, prior to pregnancy is often recommended, and also during breastfeeding. The last vitamin is vitamin B12, also known as cobalamin. And Cobalamin is almost exclusively available from meat. There are various flora also or bacteria and fungus that can produce it via fermentation. This form is harder to absorb, but not impossible. Uh, the general rule is that vegans have to supplement B12 in order to get enough. However, there might be some debate about this in the modern nutritional community because if you can get it from yeast then technically you could get it from enough from your diet because you recycle a large amount b12 gets bound to proteins uh, and released by stomach acids and pepsin in this which binds it to intrinsic faster factor in the intestines um if you have low pancreatic secretions, it will also lower your B12 absorption. And if you are deficient, it'll de you'll develop something called pernicious anemia or also macrocytic anemia if you have low intrinsic factor in your stomach. B12 is the only no known nutrient that contains cobalt, and it's responsible for converting folate into an active form and putting myelin sheath on our nerves, which make it essential for nerve impulse uh, transmission. Our body stores B12 unlike on any of the other B vitamins, and therefore it can recycle some, but it, you still have to supplement with your diet. Vitamin C is the last water-soluble vitamin. Uh, this is a very important one because it's um, essential to the formation of connective tissues like collagen, which makes up the large portion of the structural proteins in our body and is important for things like wound healing. And it also functions as an antioxidant. Vitamin C is sensitive to both heat and air, so it breaks down in when it's cooked or uh, left in a high oxygen environment and if you get too much vitamin C it will just cause you to have diarrhea because it'll irritate your intestinal lining vitamin C needs are generally higher in smokers alcoholics uh, people with sedentary lifestyles like computer workers uh, and people who are taking antibiotics or cortisone because these all tax your body and lead to higher inflammation, which leads you to require more collagen synthesis and antioxidant activity. And vitamin C is generally found in citrus fruits, uh, 
for which reason they soldiers used to be uh, used to have limes or lemons in their rations to eat so they their teeth didn't fall out the next set of vitamins is fat soluble vitamins which are vitamins A D E and K and these are absorbed best when they're taken with fat and they're um, stored in the body so we, it, you can become toxic much, much more easily than with the B vitamins. Uh, these are also generally destroyed by high heat uh, such as deep frying and so deep fried foods tend to have none of these vitamins in them. Uh, in general vitamin A protects the retina and is actually called retinol. Vitamin D is required for calcium metabolism and the building of healthy bones. Vitamin E is an antioxidant which protects our cells and keeps them healthy. And vitamin K is an important clotting agent and also involved in calcium metabolism. Here is a list of the fat-soluble vitamins, their primary functions, recommended intakes, food sources, and toxicity and deficiency symptoms, just like for the other vitamins. I'm not going to read through all these, but this is a nice reference point that you can use to... Uh, summarize all the things that you've learned. The first one we'll talk about is vitamin A, which is mainly responsible for preventing night blindness because it's, it has a role in dark vision. Its chemical name is retinol, and it's mostly found in egg yolks, cod liver oil, milk products, and butter. It's uh, what we call a uh, provitamin, so there are various metabolic stages of it that can be consumed and made into vitamin A, like beta carotene or other molecules called carotenoids, and they're found in things like carrots. Uh, the next vitamin arguably the one of the most important fat soluble vitamins is vitamin D the sunshine vitamin and it's referred to as the sunshine vitamin because it is synthesized from cholesterol in the skin which reacts to the sun the UV light in the sun converts it to vitamin D3 an issue that a lot of people have in northern latitudes is that the sun is not strong enough in the winter time to produce enough vitamin D3 uh, to keep us healthy, so uh, we tend to need to supplement. However, since vitamin D is stored, you can, in principle, consume it more heavily. You could consume it, but from mostly from food in the winter time, and get it mostly from the sun in the summertime. Things like mushrooms, egg yolks, cod liver oil, sea fish, and avocados all have vitamin D in them. Uh, I mentioned that it's important in calcium metabolism, and in fact, it regulates absorption of calcium and bone formation. Uh, this is especially important because we only absorb about 10 to 15 percent of the calcium that we consume, and calcium de vitamin D deficiency leads to bone softening and curving, which is referred to as rickets in children or osteomalacia in adults. Now, you can't become toxic in vitamin D unless you take a vitamin D supplement, which uh, tends to be absorbed better if you take it with vitamin D. Now, when you are, the, the, the form of vitamin D that your body makes is vitamin D3, which comes from a cholesterol in the skin which is then converted into the usable form of, of vitamin D. However, supplementation often occurs as vitamin D2, which is not the most bioactive form, and it's not easily converted. Now, if you are going to supplement D3 in a northern climate, you should probably consume between 600 and 2,000 milligrams a day, uh, and you want to do this with foods that are high in fat and vitamin K2. Uh, now, if you're going to eat it from food, you could do this by making something like a mushroom and kale omelet. 
Another thing that vitamin D is important in, uh, because it's important to all parts of calcium metabolism, this is involved in muscle contraction as well, which is, helps improve balance and also enhances muscle tone. It's especially important for people that have osteoporosis as they age. Uh, now, a lot of people worry about skin cancer, and they wear sunscreen whenever they're in the sun. This, as you might imagine, does actually interfere with vitamin D production. And uh, vitamin D is arguably more important than eliminating your sun exposure. A large amount of skin cancer comes from artificial tanning under powerful UV lamps. And if you just practice safe habits and don't stand out in direct sunlight in the middle of the day for hours at a time, uh, you can probably avoid getting sunburns and also get plenty of vitamin D. Vitamin D is also very important for immune health as well as cardiovascular health. And can also be involved in the prevention of cancer, uh, as well as other heart disease and other chronic diseases. So it's involved in building strong bones, uh, decreases the risk of osteoporosis, especially in the elderly, who are more, more have weaker muscles and are more prone to falls. The research recently has also uncovered the roles of vitamin D in regulating critical cellular functions. And uh, in the immune system, it can also help prevent, or rather the deficiency of it can increase your risk of colon cancer and other cancers. Uh, a number of autoimmune diseases, including type 1 diabetes and multiple sclerosis, have also been implicated with vitamin D deficiencies, um, as well as things like tuberculosis. If you... Uh, heart disease is partially related to muscle contraction, so if you have a vitamin D deficiency, this is going to mess with the, your heart. And in fact, people who are deficient in vitamin D are twice as likely to have a heart attack as uh, people who had adequate vitamin D. And finally, uh, these studies are all in their... Uh, sort of early stages, so they haven't been definitively proved through uh, bl double blind testing or anything like that. Uh, well, I think this is actually starting to happen more and more. There's been a lot of really interesting research articles recently, for instance, about the role of vitamin D in uh, your body's antiviral response, especially in the wake of COVID-19. Now, vitamin E is one that isn't often... Uh, really talked about much, except as it functions primarily as an antioxidant. Now, what that means in the context of your body is that it prevents re reactive molecules from destroying your cells, which helps reduce the effects of aging uh, and leads to a healthy vascular and nervous system. Because if you have a lot of inflammation from damaged cells in your arteries, for instance, you're going to be more likely to build up plaque, which will lead to high blood pressure and all sorts of fun things. Vitamin E is readily available in things like egg yolks, oils, nuts, avocados, and greens, and it helps the absorption of vitamin A. Another name for vitamin E is tocopherol. And then vitamin K, there are two forms of vitamin K. Vitamin K1 is the one that's involved in clotting. It's known as phyloquinone. It's a coenzyme that helps form platelets. And uh, a high dose of vitamin A and E will actually work against vitamin K1. And it needs bile salts to be absorbed. So if you don't have the right amount of uh, cholesterol, if your cholesterol metabolism is off or you aren't producing uh, enough bile from for phospholipids, you'll have a problem getting vitamin K1. It comes from vitamin, from leafy greens, prunes, fermented foods, green teas, cabbage family foods like Brussels sprouts and sauerkraut. And vitamin K will generally interfere with anticoagulants because it is a clotting agent. Now vitamin K2 is the animal form of K, of vitamin K, but it's also found in fermented foods, and it 
is called meno menoquinone, and it activates 17 inert proteins. Uh, it also helps keep arteries flexible and pliant, and is involved in the production of a protein osteocalcin, which is the protein that is involved in bone construction. Now, K2, because it's made in fermented foods, fermented foods are generally uh, made by introducing specific bacterial flora that are also found in our bodies, and this causes lactic acid fermentations and other things. Uh, so our bodies make a small amount of K2 uh, in our intestines. Now, if you are experiencing calcium deficiency or vitamin D deficiency, then you might have to additionally supplement vitamin K to improve your ability to metabolize calcium. And with both the, vit the K vitamins, babies lack these when they're born. So they're typically injected with vitamins K1 and 2 at birth. Uh, especially if their mothers can't breastfeed them. Now, there's another class of compounds that I mentioned before called phytochemicals, which are f compounds that are found in food with health benefits but are not considered vitamins or nutrients. Uh, these are high in things that we refer to as superfoods. So things like carotenoids, which are um, found in uh, carrots and uh, other root vegetables like sweet potatoes, they tend to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer, as well as age-related eye diseases, and they form a precursor to vitamin A. They tend to be deep red or orange in color, and they're also found in things like squashes and pumpkins. Uh, flavonoids are precursors to B vitamins, and they're also brightly colored. They tend to also be associated with lower risk of cardiovascular disease, reduced inflammation, um, blood clotting, blood pressure, increased detoxification of carcinogens, reduction and replication of cancerous cells. And they come from things like brightly colored berries, tea, chocolate, uh, dark purple grapes, and other uh, a number of other foods. Phenolic acids are similar to flavonoids. And they come from things like coffee beans and a lot of different fruits, as well as potatoes and oats and mustard. And then there's phytoestrogens, which are the subject of a decent amount of controversy because some people uh, suggest that phytoestrogens can cause your body to react as if it's being dosed with steroids. And um, this is has a limited validity, but um, what these compounds do do is they can help uh, with bone health and reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and cancers of the reproductive tissues. You generally find phytoestrogens in soy products as well as flax seed and whole grains. And then another phytochemical, the last one, organosulfur compounds. These are found in things like garlic and things in the garlic family, as well as cruciferous vegetables such as broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, horseradish. And these are, in general, considered to be uh, antioxidant and protect cancer-protecting molecules. Uh, so organosulfides, these are uh, members of the allium vegetable family. Um, they help remove toxic compounds from our body, and as well as enhancing immune function. Phytoestrogens, um, these are non-steroidal plant compounds that are similar in structure to estrogen. Um, these technically do have the ability to cause estrogenic and or anti-estrogenic effects if taken in copious amounts. Um, now, uh, you don't really have to know all of this information on the second thing, but lignans are a type of fiber, and uh, many of the phytoestrogens are also flavonoids. Now, flavonoids or bioflavonoids come from the Latin word uh, flavus, meaning yellow, and uh, these are general secondary metabolites in plants. They are found in many fruits, as well as things like red onions, 
parsley, uh, as well as like red wine and dark chocolate. Uh, humans get a lot of these in if they eat a whole foods diet and they getting enough of them which indicates they can uh, modify things like allergens and viruses and carcinogens as well as providing anti-allergic, anti-inflammatory, anti-microbial, anti-cancer, and anti-diarrheal activities. Uh, the carotenoids, these can function as antioxidants. They can also provide a source of vitamin A. They can enhance your immune function and your reproductive health. And the, um, the need for antioxidants in your body can be affected significantly by lifestyle factors. So smoking and regular alcohol consumption cause tissue damage, which um, causes highly reactive molecular fragments to be flying around in your bloodstream. Carotenoids take care of those and prevent them from causing further damage to your body. You can get them in things like carrots, sweet potatoes, spinach, kale, collard greens, papaya, bell pepper, and tomatoes. And now that we've discussed all of the vitamins, we can sort of categorize them into the way the different body functions they participate in. So the energy generators for help, helping convert your food into energy are things like pantothenic acid, niacin, thiamine, riboflavin, folate, vitamin B12, vitamin B6, biotin, and vitamin C. So all the B vitamins, all the water-soluble vitamins. The tissue guardians are the fat-soluble vitamins D, K, C, uh, D, K, and A, as well as vitamin C, which is water-soluble antioxidant, or, or rather... Um, it helps with collagen synthesis. It is also an antioxidant, along with vitamin C, E, and A, as well as the carotenoids. And things that help with your blood health are vitamin K, B12, B6, and folate. Now, an antioxidant just donates hydrogen to free radicals in your blood, which prevents oxidative damage to cells, DNA, and, low and lowers inflammation. Many phytochemicals are antioxidants, vitamin E, vitamin A, um, vitamin C and selenium is a mineral that is an antioxidant and it's part of this thing called glutathione peroxidase it's also a component of thyroxine which is a thyroid hormone and then copper, iron, zinc and manganese all act as cofactors in antioxidant enzymes <clears throat> the bone health nutrients uh, this is, so the process of bone synthesis is you make a collagen, uh, matrix, and then you ossify it with minerals to create bone. Uh, we use calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and fluorine as our major bone matrix, but this is controlled by vitamin D, which aids in the absorption of minerals such as calcium and phosphorus. Uh, also, uh, consumption of protein, uh, which helps make collagen and this provides the framework for the mineral hydroxyapatite which is the calcium phosphorus magnesium and fluorine mineral that makes up our bones and teeth uh, vitamin c is important for collagen production and vitamin k is important for bone metabolism our bone density reaches its peak by age 30 so most of our density is created in the late teens and early 20s uh, making calcium much more highly absorbed and during these times and the general bioavailability of bone minerals is poor, so you have to get a lot of them in your diet. And if you don't, you get things like osteoporosis and osteopenia, which can be mitigated by diet, weight-bearing exercise, and moderate protein consumption. Now, if you are an athlete, your bone health can deteriorate if you do thing, things that are bad for you. It's called the athletic triad, which is inadequate calorie consumption, strenuous exercise, and a decrease in sex hormones. These will all lower your bone density. Now, blood health is also mitigated by a number of different uh, nutrients, and all of these we're going to go into in much greater detail next time. Uh, water is obviously very important in blood health because our bodies are 70% water. Uh, but also protein for the formation of hemoglobin and platelets, as well as collagen, white blood cells, and on, onward. Iron 
which we recycle about two thirds of, but an anemia is the most common nutrient deficiency worldwide um, due to the relative abundance of heme versus non-heme iron. Uh, vitamin C helps us absorb non-heme iron, which, and as well as copper, but we have to then convert the non-heme iron into heme iron, which takes energy. Vit the vitamins B6, B12, and B9 are involved in both heme synthesis, which is involved in converting non-heme iron to heme iron, uh, as well as DNA synthesis, homocysteine levels. And then vitamin K is in responsible for clotting factors, or factors in uh, the synthesis of proteins. Now, blood health is also related to immunity. Um, so you, um, you need essential fatty acids, you need protein, you need vitamins A, C, and E, zinc, copper, iron, selenium, and fiber to feed the microorganisms in your gut. These are all, we'll talk about all these in depth when we talk about immunity. And then finally, energy metabolism. You need calories from any of the caloric nutrients. You need B vitamins, which form the basis of things like NAD, FAD, TTP, and all these other things. They're mostly B vitamins, but you also need iodine. You need sulfur, which forms the basis of a number of uh, vitamins and amino acids. And you need chromium to help you regulate insulin production. And this brings us to uh, our discussion of nutrient density again. Uh, things like kale, collard, and mustard greens have enormous amounts of B vitamins and vitamin A and minerals in them. And this makes them incredibly nutrient dense. And in fact, this list of 10 foods are the top 10 most nutrient dense foods you could eat. Notice that almost all of these are green leafy vegetables. And all of, almost all of them, in fact, are green. Um, that's because green is a color that encompasses a large amount of uh, molecular st structures that are involved in the vitamins that you find. But if you ate a lot more of any of these in your diet, you would probably become significantly more healthy. And hopefully you could find one thing on this list that you enjoy, even if it's just cauliflower. Now, the least nutrient-dense foods you can eat are all things that a lot of people like to eat a lot of. So things like cola or french fries. And believe it or not, olive oil is really just fat. Vanilla ice cream is just fat and sugar. American cheese is the most rendered-down version of whey protein you could possibly consume. Potato chips are just fat and carbs. Low-fat yogurt has n eliminates at least half of the reason for consuming yogurt, which is fat-soluble vitamins. Uh, Swiss cheese and apple juice. Apple juice takes apples and removes all of the nutrients that you eat apples for, which are the soluble fibers and insoluble fibers, as well as the potassium. Another th uh, instance of a high nutrient density food are pasture-fed eggs. Uh, now, pasture-fed eggs means the chickens are roaming around in a yard and eating grass and bugs and things instead of being cooped up in a small cage. These, in general, they have four to six times more vitamin D than cage-fed chickens and a third less cholesterol with a quarter less saturated fat, two-thirds more vitamin A, three times more vitamin E, seven times more beta-carotene, two, and two times more omega-3 fatty acids. And uh, one last significant piece of information, a Penn State study found that if you eat a spicy meal, this helps cut blood triglycerides by a significant margin. Um, blood triglycerides are the storage form of fat in your blood, and uh, this happened even when the meal was rich in oily sauces and high in fat. So they documented a one-third decrease in tri blood triglycerides between people who ate an um, oily meal that was spiced and people who ate one that was not spiced. Uh, this means that eating spices like turmeric, cumin, and coriander, in addition to providing a large amounts of flavor, can also help reduce the amount of fat that you make from the food that you eat. 
and that's our discussion of micronutrients, or rather, our introduction to micro, micro, micronutrients, and um, our introduction to the concept of vitamins. So we're going to talk about next time and expand upon a lot more about minerals, as well as the role of all the micronutrients in uh, fluid balance, cardiovascular health, and uh, bone health and blood health.